Hey, thanks for tuning in today. We're so glad you decided to catch the message this weekend. All summer long, we've been talking about Jonah and the whale, or the big fish anyway. And so as we kind of dive in, uh, we just wanted to welcome you and invite you to join us in worship anytime. If you're physically able, that is, we'd love to see you at any of our services on Saturdays at 6.15, Sunday at 9, Sunday at 10.30. Uh, summer, we're pretty low key, but we've got a few things coming up, getting ready to get started. We always have mission opportunities, so I encourage you to check that out. If there's a way that we could pray for you, also check that out on our website. But two, two things I want you to mark your calendar for before we dive into the message. One is a cornhole tournament that we have coming up August 11th. That'll be a Sunday afternoon. It'll be a great time for the whole family. And we're gonna be beginning our Wednesday night ministry. So we hope you can join us for that. A lot of great things going on here at First Church. We hope you enjoy the message now, but we also hope that you can take a moment to engage with us too. So here's a message from Pastor Doug. Wow, I am so glad to be here in worship. I don't know about you, maybe this feels like a responsibility or an obligation or a duty today, but I'm just here because I, I, I don't want to be anywhere else this morning, and, um, and it's good to be here. So I want to go back a couple of weeks. I know that uh, July's almost gone, um, and uh, one of the things that my family and I do um, is uh, we like to spend around the 4th of July up in Colorado. We just kind of like that. Uh, I'm not too much into heat. I'm not too much into bugs. Uh, I'm not too much into humidity. So that's oftentimes one way we can get, a get away from some of that. So uh, it was on the evening of uh, July 5th. My family and I had enjoyed uh, a, a great meal at one of our favorite restaurants in Colorado, and we followed up the meal with uh, a short walk in a beautiful park. It was a great ending to what was a wonderful, wonderful day just together as family. Well, we went back to our motel, and uh, we began to kind of settle in a little bit, you know, and we were chit-chatting and that kind of thing. And, and uh, we heard something outside, and it kind of sounded like maybe somebody was messing with the door. I don't know what that does to you uh, when you're uh, in that kind of setting, but it made us all a little bit uneasy. So I was the one who went and looked outside. Of course, I don't look through the little peephole. Uh, I opened the door, you know. And, uh, but I was kind of surprised by what I saw. Uh, and I turned around and announced to uh, the family, it's hailing, okay? Hailing, not helling, hailing, okay? It's hailing. Uh, a, a gentle kind of summer rain shower had transformed itself into a raging thunderstorm with strong winds and heavy rain and uh, very large uh, hail. Our daughters rushed out to join me outside. Of course, that's where you go in a major, you know, catastrophic storm, isn't it? You go outside to enjoy it. So uh, we were out there enjoying the storm. And it was just obvious to me again that God's creation showcases some of the most amazing power and incredible beauty during storms. Now, I know, you know too, that at the same time, uh, storms can release a lot of destruction and there can be a lot of disaster that comes become of storms. Well, Jonah was one who barely escaped a violent storm on the ocean. There's the wind and there's the waves and there's the water and it's all crashing in and threatening to destroy the ship on which Jonah is sailing. But more important than the ship maybe going down is that this storm is threatening to destroy Jonah's life. But the storm that's raging on the ocean is nothing compared to the storm that's raging inside Jonah's heart. And just as Jonah tried to run from the storm on the ocean, now in this text, this part of the story, Jonah is running from the storm inside. Jonah's heart storm begins when the Lord asks Jonah to share the word of God with other people. The call of God is sometimes unsettling and uncomfortable and quite disturbing. The heart storm intensifies when Jonah is in the belly of the fish and he cries out to God for mercy. 
The mercy of God is sometimes difficult to believe and almost impossible to trust. Jonah's heart storm, storm escalates even more when evil people take a step towards the heart of God. The love of God is sometimes more powerful than we can imagine or even understand. Now Jonah's a lot like you and me. He finds it easier to believe a report of mass violence by evil people than he does to believe a report of mass repentance by evil people. We, we find it easier to believe that evil, evil people would do something terrible than we would to believe that evil people might actually repent and have a change of heart and, and experience the grace of God. So for us, like Jonah, it's difficult to believe that, that a dead church can turn to Jesus and then share the love of Jesus with other people in a way that causes that church to come to life again. It's difficult to believe that a spiritually apathetic town can turn to Jesus and then love Jesus more than anything else and the history of that town be transformed. It's difficult to believe that a corrupt business can turn to Jesus and then provide a Christ-centered and profitable work environment. It's difficult to believe that an immoral and violent nation can turn to Jesus and then show real compassion to the poor and the lost. So when we see God's mercy and grace change the heart of a person or of a church, or of a town, or of a nation, it often causes a heart storm inside of us. Jonah wants no part of God's redemptive work in the lives of other people. He wants no part of God's redemptive work in the lives of other people. Jonah watches as the power of the Word of God leads people who are evil and violent and cruel and oppressive closer and closer to the heart of God. But Jonah does not like it one single bit. Look at Jonah chapter 4 verse 1. We hear this report. Jonah was really upset and angry. And then a little bit later in verse 3, Jonah puts these words of complaint in a prayer to the Lord. And he prays in this way, Now let me die. I'd be better off dead. We're not used to hearing things like that in the Bible, are we? But that's how intensely this heart storm is raging inside of Jonah. All Jonah wants to do is run away from the storm inside of his heart. All I want to do is die. If it comes down to seeing this town turned around, this evil people, this evil place turned around and become more like God, I want no part of it. I'd rather die. If it comes down to seeing these Ninevites in heaven, I'd rather die. Do you get the point? Think about in your own life, that person who has hurt you more than any human being. And then you think about Jesus changing their heart and them going to heaven. And in heaven, Jesus asks you to hold their hand. It's hard to believe. Hard to believe in that kind of mercy, in that kind of grace. All Jonah wants to do is run away from that stuff. He wants no part of, of the power of God's mercy, the power of God's word to change a whole city and turn them towards God. Now, on the one hand, Jonah, Jonah is kind of spiritual, He's kind of spiritual, you know, and so he wants the people in Nineveh to love the Lord with all of their heart, soul, and mind. He wants the mercy of God to show up for these evil people. But at the same time, Jonah also wants these evil people to experience God's judgment. 
He wants them to experience the fullness of God's anger, and he wants God to punish them until it hurts. This guy's messed up, isn't he? But so are we, because we often are the same way. We want to say we believe in God's mercy, but if we're truly honest about it, we want God to kind of show these people and teach them a lesson because they have been so mean and so abusive and so oppressive along the way. So in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah prays, Our Lord, I knew from the very beginning. Okay, Jonah's going all the way back. I knew from the very beginning that you wouldn't destroy Nineveh. What that verse reveals is from the very beginning, all Jonah wanted was for God to destroy the people in that city. Not show them mercy. Not redeem them, not save them, not bring them closer to the heart of God. He wanted God to destroy them. You see, Jonah's heart is focused more upon the judgment of God than it is upon the love of God. And there's a reason for this. If you read the whole book of Jonah, it becomes a little more clear. You see, if the Lord welcomes these evil people then Israel will have to share the blessings of God. And why would I want to share these precious blessings of God with someone who's hurt me? I want them all for myself. But there's something even a little more personal about this. If God saves these people in Nineveh, if God's mercy redeems their lives and brings them into the kingdom then Jonah's going to have to learn how to love people who have hurt him very deeply. Do you understand now why there's a heart storm raging inside of Jonah? We deal with this same thing in our own lives. Jonah wonders how a merciful and just God can show love to Israel while also showing mercy to their greatest enemy. How does that work? It makes no sense. And after a while, Jonah just runs out of hope. He runs out of courage. He runs out of strength. And all he wants to do is run away from this storm in his heart. And he says, I just want to die. I just want to die. A heart storm rages in Jonah because his identity and his dream and his ultimate faith are based on something other than the Lord God. Now, I'm not saying that Jonah does not believe in the Lord. He does. What I'm suggesting here is that there's something that's more important than that. His relationship with God is number two or number three. It's not number one. What's number one for Jonah is the safety and security of his home country, Israel. That's what's most important. So when God begins to show mercy to, to the enemy of Israel, what happens is this loyalty to country before God is revealed. And that's hard. That's hard. Jonah's struggling with this just like you and I struggle with what does it mean to be a Christ follower but unable to forgive this person over here what does it mean to be a Christ follower but not wish God's blessing on this person over here we have the same heart storm as Jonah and be aware that this is not some kind of theological conversation or philosophical conviction for Jonah, this is a matter of the heart because we can tell in the text that he's giving intellectual assent to the belief that God's mercy is for all people. But in his heart, he's not there yet. He's not there yet. Jonah chapter 2 verse 9, Jonah prays, For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. He knows this in his head, but he doesn't know it in his heart. 
So when God shows grace, amazing grace to the Ninevites, Jonah just gets angry. He rejects God and he gives up on life. The salvation of other people is less important to Jonah than his own sense of safety and security for Israel. The salvation of other people is less important to Jonah than his own need to be right. The heart storm in Jonah rages because Jesus is not Lord in Jonah's life. I've shared this before. Every single one of us want a savior but it's a different matter when it comes to having Jesus be Lord because that means he's in the number one spot Jonah had something else in the number one spot and as long as there is something more than more important than Jesus in your heart you will struggle to find peace and purpose and possibility in your life. Instead, you will often be self-righteous and judgmental when faced with the failures or the sin of other people. Pride will always be a close companion, and you'll often look down on other people. That's what Jonah was doing. He was judgmental and self-righteous, and pride grabbed a hold of his heart. And as if that's not enough, insecurity will be a close companion and fear will steal away joy whenever joy shows up. You'll often avoid or ignore or like Jonah, run away from the emptiness and the hurt and the loneliness inside your heart. So for some of you today, there's a heart storm raging just like it was for Jonah. There's a heart storm raging For many others of us, the storm is not raging right now. It's not tearing us up, but it's kind of brewing. It's a little subtle. It's a little quiet. It's a little sophisticated, but it's there in the background. And if some things kind of come into the proper orbit, it will blow up and it will rage in our heart, just like it did for Jonah. So I want to just give you an invitation this week come back to Jesus I know you love Jesus that's not the point but maybe your relationship with Jesus is not the number one thing right now before the storm breaks out put him back up there and number one invite Jesus to work with you to work with you on your pride or on the focus of your loyalty. Invite Jesus to work with you. Pardon me. If right now you're a little judgmental or if you're a little insecure, I just invite you this week. Invite Jesus to be Lord of your heart and of your mind and of your soul. I shared last night and just believe this is all my heart. I think this is something a Christ follower has to do every day, not once in your life, but when you get up in the morning, you say, Jesus, today, I want you as my number one. I want you as Lord in my life. I don't want it to be my job. I don't want it to be this. I don't want it to be that. I want you to be Lord of my life. Give me the faith. Give me the courage, give me the strength to live that way this day. I just encourage you this week, invite Jesus to work with you to have him be Lord of your life. Let's pray. Jesus, there are so many reasons why we might begin to focus our loyalty on something other than you. There are so many different kinds of things that that can begin to circulate and, and, and happen in our lives where you slip out of that number one place as our Lord. 
We're sorry, Jesus. We're sorry that we have allowed that to happen. And it's not today, Jesus, like like we feel that you are far away or that we have drifted far away from you. It's not that at all. But we just sense that maybe there's a little more distance there than is really healthy. So Jesus, be Lord of our mind. Control our thought processes this week. Be Lord over our thinking. And Jesus, we invite you to be Lord of our heart. Our heart's about our emotions and our our feelings. It's about our relationships. It's about our love. Don't let the stresses and the strains, don't let the hurts and the hang-ups squeeze you out this week, Jesus. It invites you to be Lord of our heart. And then there's our soul, our essence. Sometimes darkness creeps in. Sometimes doubt creeps in. Sometimes distraction creeps in. Jesus, in our core, in our soul, be Lord. We invite you. We give you room. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for loving us. We just want your love, your grace, your mercy. to be the most important thing in our life today. So we ask you, Jesus, to be Lord of our life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.